Dr. Uh, Derek uh, Greenfield is a race relations educator and diversity inclusion expert. Uh, that's a big title, uh, Dr. Greenfield. Is that all on your business card? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's even more. How about that one, Fred? I, look, you're sought after for this stuff. And I, I, I wanted to talk to you because I'm, I'm, we seem to be, and again, it's the media portrayal sometimes, we seem to be more divided as a country than ever. And I was reading something culturally, I think, that Dr. Thomas Sowell had posted a couple of days ago about how in 1962, before we, we, we started... Uh, uh, at the height b- before the beginning of the civil rights movement, we didn't have the kind of crime in the black community that we have now. And, and it's not just the black community. It seems like around the world we seem to have everybody's put up fences where it, it, what's what's changed? What do you think has changed? And, and you're, you're sought after for this stuff. What do you go in and tell people? Because we're all going to have to get along. We all have to work together. Right. Absolutely. And there's a couple of factors. One, we need to look at structural conditions. You know, some of the communities you talk about that have experienced more crime, there were jobs, there was hope, there was uh, role models, there was so much going on. And when a lot of economic changes took place in our society, a lot of that then impacted particular communities in ways that were devastating. Uh, so, but and also at the individual level, I think that we're more aware of some of these challenges. I think that sometimes uh, uh, we're now put in situations where we are bumping up against each other without the kind of cultural competence, without the awareness of, of the differences. So before, when people lived in separate worlds they never interacted now we're actually coming face to face with one another and it's challenging but it's wonderful we have a great chance now i think and if you look at the japanese word for crisis it has both the word danger and opportunity Mm -hmm. we have opportunity now for us to really be honest about how privilege operates in our society we have a chance to really be honest about how some people really aren't getting the same kind of treatment as others and let's be willing to accept that let's be willing to hear each other's stories and move together positively but we have to look at some of the structural conditions which are putting certain people not at the same place as others but a lot of you're right it is an economy and I, i'm a big believer in a rising tide lifts all boats uh reagan said it but some other people have said it as well we we, we have reached a point where uh government's not helping in fact we're about to ship more jobs overseas um the opportunity seemed to be less but it goes back to you got to have the educational skills to move forward there, there are just so many challenges, but, you know, because you, you, you also, I want to get to this hip-hop culture thing. There, there's a culture out there that says, and I remember this, and it was scary to me, that if, you, if you're educated, if you try to better yourself, you're acting white. That scared me. Is that kind of going away, or is that rearing its head again? I think there's a segment in any community where, where some folks may not necessarily uh, want others to, to rise and succeed. But hip-hop is a general culture for the most part. There's a difference between hip-hop and hip-pop. The pop stuff that you hear on the radio oftentimes glamorizes particular negative kinds of ideas because it sells CDs. But really, hip-hop is a beautiful culture that's alive and well. And so many people that I know who are college graduates love hip-hop because it, it speaks to their experiences. It shares some things that they've gone through, and it gives voice to what they are feeling and going through. So many people... People have been really uplifted and inspired by hip-hop's positive message, so I, I wouldn't want to put it there. But I think it's important for us to, you know, to recognize that, that we all have biases. We can point the finger at somebody else, but we got three fingers pointing right back at us. And to look at some of the things, you know, there was an interesting study recently. They put black and white riders onto a, a bus, and they said, go up to the driver and say, hey, I don't have enough money in my card. Uh, will you let me just ride for free? I only need to go a mile. Well, 72% of white riders were allowed to ride for free and 36% of black riders. And so there are some of these unconscious biases. I don't think people are intentionally evil and wrong, but I think sometimes we're not willing to look at the fact that, you know, we've got some stuff within us when it comes to gender, when it comes to sexuality. So let's be open and honest and hear what people have to say, look at our own biases. And then also, I do think there is a role for government. You know, people say, oh, we don't want government in our lives, but we love the roads when they're paved. We love the fire department when it comes and, and we love the Social Security check. When, when we needed folks to be educated coming back from war, we did a GI Bill. And there's some communities, like we mentioned in Baltimore and others, that really those children, you can blame the parents if you want, but children all deserve an equal opportunity. So if we did pump more money into education and job programs and park districts and resources, what would it hurt to say the government can also be a part of supporting people to have an equal shot in life? But Baltimore is a perfect example of you've had the same people in charge since 1967, and it's as worse as it ever, as it's ever been. I mean, we've, we've got to have some new ideas, don't we? 
Well, and I think some of those ideas are, if you look at the communities in which people were responding and, and you saw some of the, the uprisings, uh, there are no, the education system is broken. There, there are no resources. There's no boys and girls clubs and after school programs. There, there are no jobs programs. They've been completely cut out of budget. So I, I really do believe that uh, when people say you know, things are worse, well, it's because we haven't provided the same kind of support and safety net that's critical. Yes, we have individual responsibility, but yes, it's also about as a society, aren't we better than that to say that people are just up to their own devices? Some folks are starting 10 meters behind other people in a 100 meter dash. And let's just make sure they get a shot. And so I, I do think there's a need to be able to provide the kind of resources so that every child growing up in Baltimore can, can look at their school and say, I'm getting a great education, can look at their community and say, I have a chance to go li- play cello and play basketball. And then maybe that'll give you the same shot as a kid living you know, 10 miles away. And just because their parents have more money and their zip code has a little bit of higher tax bracket, I still deserve the same chance they do. But, but, you, but I think in America, you do have the same chance. It's just, I think, it, 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 and again, I think it goes back to and i don't know that it's as much racial now as it's economic because you can have you can have a well you can have people in the same race that are one's well dressed and one's not well dressed and there are judgments made but again i i I think you you don't attack the rich person to make the poor person better i think you got to create the environment where the poor person wants to jump through the same oops that the you know again i don't see it as a lottery i see people work hard they deserve what they got and I think as long as everybody has access to the same hoops. And so some people may not be able to see that there are hoops there, may not have the kind of resources. And we don't want to attack the rich, those who have worked hard, but also for some folks to recognize that they may have had a little bit of a better shot. You know, I, I grew up with a, a parents who, who had a little bit of money. We weren't wealthy, but we did fine. So I got to go to a really good public educational system. And as a result, I got access to, to playing music and, and TV and radio and all the kinds of things that then inspired me in life. And then I worked in the city schools in Chicago for many years, where children had to go into the bathroom with toilet paper being doled out, and they couldn't take the textbooks home. And so if you're telling me that's an equal shot, then I think we've got to look at the shot a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Everyone deserves to have that true equal shot. Then we can say, yes, it's up to the individual. And we're not there yet. But, but the opportunity, I think, a lot of times you just need somebody to help you point in the right direction. And I, I, I wonder sometimes... If, if you're told enough that you don't matter, then you start believing you don't matter. Isn't that part of it, too? Absolutely. And I think that, indeed, for many folks and many young people that I've worked with throughout my life, who have been told and feel like from society that they don't matter when they know that across the the, the town that those children are getting access to to laboratories where they can explore science, where there's music programs. And yet in their school, there's nothing. And so then we say, well, don't worry about it. And, and I think if all of us went into a restaurant and uh, it, uh, the restaurant was, was dirty and messy, we, we wouldn't want to eat there anymore. And so some people just sort of give up because they don't feel like they're getting the same chance as other people are. Absolutely we want individuals to, to feel like they are responsible for their own lives. And I think those in power need to be responsible for their own lives and their own decisions to make sure that indeed it's equitable out there. But don't the bear, here's the part that scares me about wanting to, to create this, this equal shot for people. Sometimes the barriers are the very, I look at the, this inspiring story of, uh, of Dr. Ben Carson. Sometimes those barriers benefit you. They don't stand in your way. They make you a stronger person, right? Oh, absolutely. And for some individuals, certainly those challenges, you know, uh, that indeed you can get bitter or you can get better. But I, I do recognize that if you put 100 people in, in one situation where that, uh, you know, they're just in, in a very difficult place, a difficult school, and 100 people in a school that's well-functioning and well-resourced and positive with teachers to support them, Yes, each individual has a decision to make about how he or she responds. But we probably can pretty much, I think we'd agree, Fred, that the 100 kids going to the school with all the resources and the teachers and AP classes and, and laboratories and music and sports are probably in general going to do a lot better than the kids who go to 100, uh, the 100 kids who go to a school with nothing. And yes, they make their own decisions, but sometimes not of their own choosing. And we've got to recognize that if indeed people did have an equal and fair shot, then we can make these kinds of judgments. But until that point, I think it's unfair to beat up on people who are not getting the same kinds of of opportunities and to look at some of the implicit biases, you know, that that I mentioned before. You know, we think about Tamir Rice six months after he was uh, just killed in Cleveland. You know, the officer, when they called in, said he was 20. 
and, and he was in his twenties, and he was twelve years old. And so research has shown Philip Goff at UCLA found that you know when when white folks are evaluating the age of people of color, they often overshoot African American ages by three and a half years. There's some of these subtle biases that lead to that perception of quote unquote danger and fear that lead to outcomes that are so destructive. And so I, I think it's important for us to look structurally and individually. All right. Where do people, uh, Doctor Derek Greenfield, really uh, everyone a fair shot? Uh, tell us how. Tell us how people can find you if they want to find more information about what you do. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having this conversation. Absolutely. It's so important for us to be able to find some common ground. I'm at DerekGreenfield.com, D-E-R-E-K. Find me also on Facebook or Twitter, Professor DG. I'd love to hear from folks and continue the dialogue. All right. Dr. Greenfield, thanks so much. You have a great weekend. Thanks, you too.